Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, welcome to Making an Impact, a Bruins Guide to Nonprofit Culture. Thank you all for making it out today to back to campus. Um, we're all so excited. We're all dry here too. So just so you know, everything is safe and dry. So um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Gloria Cope. I'm Director of Young Alumni and Student Engagement. And we're so excited to have you all here. Uh, today's program is actually part of ongoing programming for young alumni. Um, fun fact, uh, about 40, 47% of our UCLA alumni are under the age of 40. So our UCLA alumni population is actually relatively young. And so we actually started doing more programming in the last year because we realized there wasn't enough for our demographic and uh, demographic of alumni. And so today's program is actually, um, was actually a part of different conversations we've had with young alumni about what they're interested in, what fields that they would like to know more about, um, and nonprofit, the nonprofit industry was definitely one of them. And so thank you so much for being here. You definitely do prove that there is an interest in this area. And we're so glad to have with us a panel of alumni who will speak to the culture of nonprofit, their experiences and perspectives, and the people that they, they've encountered to really get to this place in their careers as well. And so uh, without further ado, I wanted to turn it over to them to introduce themselves, and we'll get today started. So we'll start here with Mike. Hi, um, I'm Mai Wen. I am the Director of Development overseeing special events for Planned Parenthood Los Angeles and our sister organization, Planned Parenthood Advocacy Project. Um, I've been with Planned Parenthood for 12 years, most of my career. I um, oversee a team of three that oversees 30 events. Um, we raise $1.5 million a year uh, for Planned Parenthood. Um, here in Los Angeles, we are the second largest Planned Parenthood in the country. We're a $60 million organization that sees 150,000 patients a year in 19 centers, um, opening our 20th center this next year. So we're very excited about that. Um, and in my role, I am a fundraiser who works very closely with our, uh, va our volunteer fundraising volunteers, our CEO, and our um, senior staff. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Paco Retana, and I'm really blessed to be here with the panelists and all with all of you, so thank you for being here. Um, I'm my current role is I'm a clinical supervisor at Green Dot Public Schools, and what that is is I have oversight of providing training and supervision for graduate students that are in uh, learning to be therapists, really in the Master in Social Welfare program. Uh, that's one of my big uh, roles there, as well as uh, providing consultation to school principals, school psychologists, working with youth, families, those uh, in need of uh, mental health services. Uh, I've been there for two years. We're actually, there's about, there's 19 schools in uh, Los Angeles that are charter schools. I happen to be in South LA, and I work at Locke High School, and another school called Animal South LA. I have um, been the, the green, green Dot is also expanding, so we're now in Memphis, Tennessee, and also expanding in Washington, so we're really excited about that. I need to just share a little bit that my parents are immigrants. They came to this country, and um, where there's a, if you uh, share a little bit about my family, just a little bit, that is that my, I have a sister that's in, uh, kind of in the loan business, and then my, I have a, a, the banking business kind of thing, a loan, and then um, I have a brother who's also an alumni from UCLA, and he's uh, worked uh, for the Obama administration as well, so we're really happy with that, and I'm the oldest of, of both of them, and I'm married to a new UCLA alumni as well, who's a director of marketing at Rio Hondo Community College, so really proud about that, and um, I just, I do want to leave that I've started uh, an interest in mental health ever since I was pretty much in junior high school, so I'm a little I just dated myself, but basically that was my passion. I wanted to work with our marginalized communities, and as a Latino male and as a person of color, I was really excited about that opportunity. I had the right people, the right mentors at the right time, and I've been in the business for almost 25 years. I love what I do, and again, I'm just blessed to share as much as I can with all of you. Thank you for having me. Hi there. Uh, my name is Molly Larson. I'm Director of Operations at Chrysalis Enterprises. Uh, Chrysalis as an organization is a nonprofit that helps individuals um, coming out of possibly homelessness, but all low-income individuals on the pathway to self-sufficiency through jobs. So things that you and I take for granted, you know, having a friend look at a resume, um, having your mom or dad do some practice interview questions with you, um, running to the store to get your button-down shirt. These are all things that individuals that we help don't have access to or 
or aren't aware of. So we have um, a large curriculum that helps individuals get ready for this. Um, all of our um, clients are immediately paired with an employment specialist that acts as a case manager throughout their time with Chrysalis, helping them with a success plan so that they're able to get that job. So for individuals with barriers to employment um, that are pretty substantial, so it could be previous incarceration, um, substance abuse, the homelessness, um, they need maybe an option before they can go out and get that next job. So that's what Chrysalis Enterprises does. So we're social enterprise. We have a street maintenance business and a staffing company that does janitorial type work. Um, and I oversee our street maintenance business. So we are um, almost a $5 million trash company. Um, never thought I would be in the trash industry, but lo and behold, here I am. Um, I graduated from UCLA in 2006 in physiological science. So I thought I was going to go to med school. I also took the LSATs, thought I was gonna go to law school. Um, and then ended up going to business school um, at USC. Um, and that was actually when I was exposed to Chrysalis um, as an intern there. So I have a lot of good things to say about the possibilities with nonprofits about doing internship work or volunteer work to get exposure, not only so you understand the organization, but it's a chance to kind of, um, you know, promote yourself and what you have to offer to the organization. So thank you for having me this evening. Hi guys, uh, my name is Gabe. I graduated from this wonderful place in 2008. Uh, I was a North Campus guy, poli sci, comm studies, you know, all that stuff. Um, I have for the last five years worked for an organization called Parent Revolution. We're a nonprofit based here in LA. We do a little bit of work around the country, but, but most of our work is in the greater Los Angeles area, helping parents whose kids are at persistently low performing schools sort of get together, get organized, and fight for improvements um, initially in those neighborhood schools, um, and then sort of continue on their activism to impact change on a, a district and statewide level. Um, so it's great being here. Really excited to be on such a great panel. Good evening, my name is Sally Liu, and it says here that I'm the foundation administrator of the Nazarian Family Foundation. And I have the uh, pleasure and actually the privilege of being on the other side of the door of nonprofits. And there are, just to let you know, there are about 75,000 nonprofits in the state of California, so there are jobs out there for you all if you wanna go into this industry and this sector. Um, and all of those organizations, whether they're large, medium, small, are grant seekers. I'm on that other side of the door, I'm a grant maker. So you say, oh my gosh, it must be such fun to give away money, right? How could that be a bad job? It's not a bad job. I actually do love it. I've worked for many, many foundations um, over the years. Um, I've worked at the, as a program officer that really does all the behind the scenes work to convince the board of the directors of foundations to give money to these such of these um, nonprofits that do amazing work in the community. And, but it is, it is really hard work to give away money. That's one of the myths about being a foundation um, staff member. You think, oh yes, giving away money, giving away money, that would be a great thing to, there's a lot of work that goes behind um, conducting due diligence, satisfying the IRS requirements, um, and checking out that all the nonprofits who have this 501c3 status are really doing what they say they're doing and using money the way they are indicating it's being used. And um, so again, I have worked for many, many years in the foundation world as a philanthropoid um, and, uh, and love it. And I graduated here many, many years ago, it says 1970, um, in the English department. But a little story about this is I happened to wander over to the education department and met an amazing professor who asked, you know, uh, you know, uh, he, I don't know, I think he was having lunch on the lawn or something, and he asked how many of the folks sitting on the lawn would be interested in volunteering. And this is akin to almost an internship. And he said, there's this school in Venice that needs volunteers. And so I didn't know what I was gonna do when I grew up, and so I volunteered to work in this elementary school in Venice. And so I got into education, and I got my teaching credentials. So I did, you know, I'm, I, I'm a Renaissance woman. I'm, you know, I've done so many crazy wild things, but every so many years I look and reinvent myself and continue in this sector because I really do love it and there's a lot of great work to be done and a lot of great people to meet. So that's why I'm at. 
Thanks, Sally. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Fleischle. I'm a senior attorney in the National Water Program Director at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, for those of you who watch uh, How I Met Your Mother, I have, I have Marshall's dream job. <laughs> if you know what I'm so if you've seen the show, um, and one of my colleagues actually was the inspiration for Marshall's character, which is kind of neat. Um, NRDC has about 450 staff across the US, um, offices in New York, DC, Chicago, San Francisco, LA, and Beijing, China. Um, I run the water program. I have about 20 staff spread around the country. We work on safe and sufficient water for all, for people and for ecosystems. Um, I've, I've been with NRDC about four years. Before that, I ran an international environmental group called Waterkeeper Alliance for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for six years out of New York. And before that, I was the Santa Monica Baykeeper here in LA. And before that, I was um, this, the staff attorney for Heal the Bay. And before that, I was an oil company lawyer in Los Angeles. <laughs> fighting low-income communities, and it was horrible. <laughs> and I quit, and I sold everything I owned, and I moved to San Francisco and started volunteering for social justice issues. And uh, after a year and a half of volunteering and living in a group home with nine people and four cats, I got a paid job at Heal the Bay for $28,000, and I've never looked back. Um, and it's been a great experience, but hopefully we can talk all about these sorts of things as the night progresses. So thanks for having me. So as you can see, our panel is very, they're all so awesome. And so we're going to be going into that. Just wanted to let you know, we will be having a Q&A portion after we have a little bit of a moderated conversation here. So be sure to write down your questions if you do have them. We will have a time at the end for any questions that you think would be good for the group. And then also, we are taping this. So um, if you want, if you're missing something, you want to listen to it all again, we will have it online soon. So just wanted to let you all know that. But as we uh, know, we're going to jump right in. So panel. This can, anyone can answer this question. Not everyone has to, if you don't want to. Um, but what is a common myth about working in nonprofit? Don't yeah. do it all at once. Uh, uh, this is, I'll jump off because it's sort of like a pet peeve of mine that the word nonprofit means anything. That's like, that's, I think, the biggest myth. Like, what is a nonprofit? Like, it's just tax status. Like, it, it's such a broad term as to, I think, a lot of times be almost meaningless. Maybe that's the wrong note. I don't know if I'm like off script here, off message uh, for an event about nonprofits. <laughs> but like really, it's like, I've, I, my favorite thing is like when someone comes up to me at like random party and is like, oh, like, what do you do for work? And I'm like, oh, I, I start the sentence. Oh, I work for this nonprofit intending to like finish the sentence. They're like, oh, that's great. Before I say anything other than like I've worked for a nonprofit. I'm like, you, you really don't know what goes after that. You know, like you could think like, birth control is the worst thing in the world and I might work for Planned Parenthood, right? Or like it might be like affiliated with USC or in some way. It's like there could be so many problems with this nonprofit for you and like you have no idea. So it's like this idea like nonprofits are good and like for profits are like less good. Or, yeah, it's like or the word nonprofit. I mean, just look at the diversity of sort of organizations just amongst the random six of us up here, right? So like I think it's important to talk about nonprofits and understand them, but I also think it's important to put it in context like and not overread sort of too much into what the term actually means. Right. Um, just gave some comment about that. Um, it's really the tax status, the 501c status is not for profit. The myth about that is it doesn't mean the organization cannot make a profit. Yes, it can, and it and many do. The trick, or not the the little caveat, not trick really. The <laughs> caveat is that the profit that is made at the end of the year goes back into the organization. And corporate taxes do not get, you know, they're not taxed. So it's, even though it is a corporation, you know, they don't get taxed. So, so that is a big myth. So, you know, large, large, small, even, you know, nonprofits, they can make a profit. It is very legal. So not to be, yeah, you know, but there is this perception that you work for a nonprofit, oh, you must be poor, you can't, you know, you're doing the, the work of, you know, saints, and, and you, uh, you all are, um, but that doesn't mean you don't get paid, it doesn't mean you don't get benefits, it doesn't mean any of those things, it does just really depend on the actual nonprofit that you are interested in, so you can make money. I mean, the thing is that, you know, Planned Parenthood in Los Angeles, we are an organization of 400 employees, um, 300, about two, three quarters of which are in our clinics, but 100, 120 are on the administrative side. We have everything from a chief legal counsel to a CFO 
to a CAO. I mean, we have professional um, people that work at our organization that have come, that have switched careers and come from Skadden or come from other hospitals. Um, so, you know, we have very seasoned employees that aren't necessarily, you know, the um, hips, you know, the, the beatniks and the people that you think are nonprofits. We are very, we, I mean, I have to say Planned Parenthood, I think is the corporate of nonprofit. If you could, you know, I, I hate to use those words because I don't like corporate and nonprofit in the same sentence. But, um, but you know, it's a we're a very professional organization and we act like one and um, we we run our business like one. We are a business. Um, we um, and we we provide very high quality care for our patients and the best care that we can. And that's our goal as an organization. And that means that we're a professional organization. I, I promise you, our health centers are better than my doctor's offices. And, and that is the care that we know and we want to provide to our, our patients. I, I do want to add that um, you can live comfortably in the nonprofit world, right? Um, what that means is that, yeah, you're definitely not in the one percenters for sure, <laughs> but um, you can make a, a, a great career out of being in the nonprofit world, and it's very professionalized. It's a great organization to work in. I've worked in uh, in mental health facilities. That's mostly been my career, and non contracted with, uh, for example, the Department of Mental Health. So definitely, nonprofit organizations are are in the are in the business to make change, not change in the kind of bling bling kind of change, but just change and societal uh, change type of thing. But uh, definitely it's, a, it's, a, it's very comfortable and um, you can make uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you can do some work consulting and supplementing as well as your income and just to do that. But I don't like, also I agree with you, you go to a conversation, oh you look in the, non you, you work in nonprofit and it's almost this, wow. <laughs> How do you do it? Like, whoa, like you're so, and it comes off so, like, no, this is, listen to I really, what I, what I do, but it has that kind of, I don't know, just so artificial interest, so, but I just, that's what I wanted to echo in short. I, there's one other misconception that nobody's mentioned that I think is important. Um, a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to go work for a nonprofit because I want a flexible schedule or it's yeah. less, less effort than if I were in a for-profit cutthroat firm or something like that. And that's just so not true. The beauty of it is if, you know, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Um, and so I work as hard as I did when I was a corporate lawyer. I just don't feel it the same way. I sleep better. I have more energy. I'm more passionate and connected to what I'm doing. And I, I, I don't want people to have the misconception that, oh, you know, I can go do, go run a nonprofit and have all this extra spare time. It just doesn't happen. It consumes who you are, but it is who you are, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel the same. Right. And I think you work with people that really love the organization as much as you do, and you can see it in, every day, in your every day. You see it when you go to work. You see it when you're across the table with someone, that everybody is there for the best interest of the organization, and, and he's right, you don't, you don't feel like you're working. I think one, one thing I'll add, I can't be the only panelist to not speak, um, <laughs> but um, you know that it's the warm fuzzy, right? Oh, you work for a nonprofit, that's warm fuzzy. Well, I have my MBA, I run a business, I compete with for-profit companies, I have very large customers that I have to keep happy, so it's a lot of what you would see in the typical for-profit sector happening in the nonprofit sector. So you can take all of those skill sets, all of that passion, the energy, the what really drives you. Um, you know, I'm just more driven by the business side of things than I am with the case management. That doesn't mean that I don't interact with clients on a daily basis, um, but I'm more driven, and that's kind of, you know, kind of what excites me and how my mind works. Um, so there are opportunities as you look into social enterprise and that type of thing to really kind of come at it from whatever angle you want to. There is a, a spot for you in the sector. Great. So on the flip side of that, what is a, you know, often misconception or stereotype that is true for you who work in a nonprofit? Well, I'll kick it off that it is warm fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it really is. There is a passion um, that 
is, I mean, it's tangible in almost any organization that you walk into um, that, you know, although maybe that's, um, you know, it was just saying that's kind of a myth and that is a myth, but that's also what drives you. You know, you could be there. I thought I was going to work with high school youth. That was honestly my career path. That's what I thought I was going to do. I had my internship um, with Chrysalis and realized there was this whole population that um, I had an interest and passion in that I'd never realized I did. Um, you know, this adult population that really needs help kind of breaking the cycle, getting back up on their feet. Um, and it's, it does help drive the work that we do. Um, so, yeah. Um, when I started 12 years ago, um, <laughs> I never thought I would be a lifer. To be honest with you, I thought, okay, I'm going to go help the world for a little while, and then, then I'm going to go and do real stuff. Um, but it just it connected with me in a way that I never thought an, a, a position would. Um, and I think if you find something that you love and you work at it and you want to work at it, you, you, gain, you become successful in what you love. Um, some, a, a bit of advice that I got actually upstairs, I was an SAA when I was in school, um, and I got some really good advice of find something you love and figure out a way to get paid for it. Um, and that's what I did. Um, and I, ne I didn't think I was doing it at the time. Um, no way. 12 years? Are you kidding? It's like career suicide to be ever anywhere for 12 years. Um, but um, I just kept, you know, learning more and it, it kept being interesting. Um, and, and it kept my interest and it kept um, being challenging. And that's what keeps me here. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think that... Uh, <laughs> when I was 26 and looking at these lifers like, oh my God, you've been here for how long? Um, and now I'm the schmuck. Um, so, <laughs> but I love it and I, and I, and I think it, it shows in my work and shows in how I talk about our organization. So, I, Yeah, I'll just um, echo as well. I, I love what I do. I, I want to wake up the next day to go to work and I've been doing this for 25 years and I just enjoy it. But it's, it's hard work, and the hard work is that you have, in my uh, industry, you have underserved, you have folks that are not served at all, and you have folks that are inappropriately served. And how do we create access to health care or mental health services if we want to drill down deeper for our communities, especially communities of color, and those folks that are out there that are, that, that are marginalized every day? So the fact that you are all here to listen to all of us share a little bit about our background, um, is, I'm excited about that. But I, uh, it is hard work. It's a daily grind. And you want to wake up in the morning and go and try to affect change in a way. Um, that's, that's what this is what this is about. It's fun. We clearly have a lot of fun doing it. You have to have a great sense of humor and laugh. And at the same time, you are in this daily grind. And again, working with families that are either homeless um, low income, uh, you might go into a home visit and it may be the, the, a disaster in that home. You know, whether the conditions are really bad, it smells, it's dirty, it, it's not familiar to you, but you go in there with a purpose and the purpose is to create that access and provide those resources. So um, I just wanted to add that too. Well, I think a couple of you mentioned the um, talking about passion and being motivated. How do you maintain that passion and motivation? Um, you know, you may have some hard days, but how do you move past it and how do you continue that energy and spirit? I think for me, it's... Um small successes. So ultimately, wouldn't it be great if all the clients that walk through our door had full-time job, benefits, you know, career things that they never thought of, pay time off, all this good stuff that we can all hope for, right? But what about the client that comes in despite having all of his or her belongings stolen the night before, right? That's progress. This is someone who we're working on their self-esteem. They've gotten to a point where even though they have to present to their case manager with something a little bit difficult, they're able to come in and have that conversation. Or the person that just gets up the nerve to go submit that application, right? It's not easy. Maybe they're doing it on foot. They're not as familiar with computers, so they're more comfortable with that handwritten um, you know, job application and they want to go submit it, that takes guts, right, to go actually into a business 
and submit that application. So I think it's those little small successes. I shouldn't, sorry, I shouldn't say little or small undermining the things that drive me. Um, but it's, you know, it's these wins, right, that the clients have that um, really kind of help me power through, um, especially on the rough days because, yeah, we are going to take some steps backwards and that's really, really hard to watch a client that's come so far move back a little bit. But Chrysalis is all about second chances. So the fact that we are there for them um, to help them get back up on their feet brush themselves off, off and keep moving um, really, really drives me. And it's a passion. Um, you know, I honestly didn't know that I could feel as passionate about the work that an organization does. Um, but it, I mean, it just, it's in me. I drank some Kool-Aid. And for me, um, on the other side of that door, to make site visits to organizations that are doing phenomenal work and you see people every day, you know, and it's hard work, as Paco said, it's not an easy job. And as Steve says, but you're doing something you love and you get, you wanna wake up in the morning, you're excited and it's the best job in the world. And as a funder to come in and see this and be able to partner with organizations out there and provide support, resources, whatever it is, um, and sometimes even collaborate, get different, a variety of organizations to come together and maybe create a movement or create an initiative or create a campaign is so, so very warming um, to the heart and to knowing that you've made a, you've made a difference. Um, one of the things that I was able to do was to work with a group of funders that came together and pooled their ideas and, um, and their resources in the same way that we ask nonprofits sometimes to come together uh, because one group can do so much. Ten groups can do so much more. So it's this um, ripple effect of really uh, maximizing resources across the board, whether you're on the grant-seeking side or the grant-making side. And that really keeps me going because it's like I always try to think of what's the next great idea? What's the... Um, possible, what's possible, the impossible, what might that look like? And sometimes I do ask nonprofits, if money were not the issue, what would you do with your organization? So that's kind of exciting for me. I wanted to add maybe, maybe less on the touchy-feely, warm and fuzzy side. And, and um, yesterday and today I was in, in meetings in Watts and there was, there was a community organizer there who, who, who said the following, and I, I think it really applies to what drives me. He said, he said, so much injustice, so little time. And, you know, that really sums up a lot of it. And I'm not a victim. All of you who have graduated from UCLA, you're not victims. And the idea of getting paid to speak truth to power is a very powerful notion that of the seven billion people on the planet, very few people even have a voice, let alone are paid to use their voice in a way that can help people. So for me, you know, you, yes, you have to have the successes and you have, to, you, know, you have to thrive on those. But when you look at all of the injustice in the world and who is going to speak out um, for that, who is gonna speak truth to power, um, that's the opportunity we have every day when we wake up. Whether it's you know, for Planned Parenthood or NRDC or for the schools, you know, and that's the perspective I try to take to it, that, that we truly are blessed to be able to do this and I don't, I don't say that in a warm and fuzzy way. I say it in an, it's a responsibility that all of us collectively have because with, with great opportunity comes great responsibility and, and that's really, for me, what drives me. I think I, I agree with a lot of that and, and, and really agree with what, what Steve was saying, but I, I think there's a missing piece here, which is the people. Like, I think for myself, and I think this is true for lots of people, maybe even most people, like you come for a cause, but you stay for a people. Like, it doesn't matter how much you believe in your cause. If you hate your boss, like you, you ain't sticking around, right? Like <laughs> if you don't like your team or you feel like your team isn't effective, right? Like if you could be part of an organization with the greatest mission ever, people very well intentioned, very nice, want to get the job done, but they're just not effective for a thousand, a million, there's an infinite number of reasons that could be true, right? So like, so I think there's under discussed a lot of time this stuff because we feel like we're, we are, I mean, people here, like we're mission driven, driven by the college and all that, but like, it's not just about that. And I think people shouldn't feel bad about finding themselves in a situation. People should look for places where they're gonna love working with the people and where the, the organization has values and a culture that like fits for them. 
um, and not try to sort of put a square peg in a round hole just because you feel like this should be what you're doing or this like intellectually is a sort of mission you're into. Like if you don't jive with the people in the culture, it's, it's not going to work um, no matter how much you believe in it. Well, that's actually a great kind of lead into my next question of, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your different offices, their culture, and, you know, how, what was it about their kind of office culture, mission, organization, um, how was that a fit for you? If you can talk about that a little bit. I, I, I'll try to address that a little bit. I um, was a director of an outpatient center in uh, South LA, and it was a agency that we provided mental health services. And uh, a certain uh, pro a proposition, uh, uh, while well, I'm drawing blanks on, the Mental Health Service Act was passed in 2004, and we had to roll out all these evidence-based practice models to provide s mental health services on depression, on trauma, you name it. And as a director, it was transformative in the sense that I had to transform a team to believe that these evidence-based practice models were effective in our community. The question was, are they culturally relevant and sensitive to our communities? And when you have line staff, providers that are smarter than you, and you as a manager are having to roll this out because we are chasing funding streams. That was the reality at that time, and it continues to be, that we're chasing funding streams to be able to, uh, to provide services to our, to our community. What it meant for me was that I had to really manage an organization or a, and a staff of over 33 people to believe that we had to use this or we, would go, we wouldn't survive. And so how do you do that in the spirit of wellness or in the spirit of providing health care to or mental health services to our community? So to me, it was really important to change that and to really believe that I, I refuse to accept that there's a prison pipeline. I refuse, or that we're, that we're gonna add to if we don't do something, or I refuse to, ex to accept that there's an achievement gap that exists, or that even in my beloved alma mater at UCLA that I've graduated twice from, that we have a poor enrollment of our African Americans in our community. I refuse to believe that. And so my work and my culture is about bringing that passion to the staff and transforming that, and some people, may accept that, another staff may look for another organization that fits their particular desire, or their diff diff particular need. It's not, there's no right or wrong about it, but that's what I do. And you just have confidence about doing it, and you a belief in doing it, and you go out there and just put in the work. So that, that's the response. Um, when you say Planned Parenthood, everybody knows, right? So it's one of those things where if there's very few people who know, don't know what Planned Parenthood does. You either you drink the Kool-Aid or you don't, right? So that's the one great thing about coming into our doors every day is that everybody is there with you. Um, walking past protesters, walking past um, those nasty, gnarly signs, everybody is with you. And there is a camaraderie there, um, definitely. Um, you walk in and you know that we're in it together. You know. Um, we had a bomb threat at one of our health centers uh, last month, and we all came together. It was one of those things where it's like, okay, what do we do? Um, and it's, um, we, as we are a family, we fight like family. I mean, you know, we have disagreements. We have, you know, the, this is the best way. It's not the best way, but at the end of the day, you, um, we are all there for each other. And I think that at Planned Parenthood, we're really, we are a, a lot of women, we do, we work, it's 75% women, um, it's who I work with. And um, it's, it's totally empowering to be there and sit across the table from, um, I, I manage a group of volunteers. And in that group of volunteers, I have the first um, female um, partner at Morris, uh, Forrester and Morris, I wanna say. Um, the first sitting judge, and um, a female judge in Santa Monica. So these are the women that I get to see and sit across the table with, and it's totally inspiring that these are the women that open the door, the door for me. And, and that's the kind of wor the world that I work in, and, and it's kind of cool to like um, be in a place that it's, it's, yeah, you're in. You know the handshake right away. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really cool vibe. Um, we, we're a, not a grassroots, but not a grassroots. We are, you know, like, I think that we, um, we run this really, cause you know, we're a wedge issue. We're abortion. 
the A word. Um, and we're a wedge issue, so I think that you know um, we we fight um, for what we believe in, and we do it as a as a collective. And I think that's that as a group is um, what you know. I think that that's that that's the culture I work in. It's very very, it's wonderful, and it's. Um, it's frustrating um, to know that you know there are people that don't like you and don't don't believe in you um, because you believe so much, but um, but you know that's that's what that's the way world, the world works. You know, not everybody's gonna like you. Cool, great. So what um, we talk about culture? So let's talk about like some a specific of an office culture. Is how do you you know? How do you rise? How do you get promoted? How do you learn more to be able to make yourself grow in an organization? I, well, um, I think that one thing, especially with any sector, right? I feel like a lot of these questions um, don't, they're not necessarily specific for the nonprofit, but it's almost like, you know, just career advice. Um, but I think that it's definitely finding, you have to search and find the ways that you can learn, right? So there are all sorts of industry magazines, um, you know, publications that you can read, networking groups. There's um, SSIR, for example, Stanford Social Innovation Review, that has fantastic articles, you know, industry setting articles talking about, you know, collective impact. You were mentioning, Sally, you know, the organization's coming together. But it's making yourself aware of those things because you automatically add value to the organization just by knowing those things, being a part of the conversation. Um, there's a social enterprise alliance that has a Los Angeles chapter start going to those um, events. It's, I think, you know, they're monthly events and just start going. So it doesn't necessarily, don't wait for an organization to do something for you. You sometimes have to be proactive and do something for yourself. Um, you know, and I think just even us, like, meeting here, all of these individuals, you know, this is now a professional development opportunity for me that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of it is just kind of creating your own opportunity and success. Don't wait for someone to hand it to you um, in any nonprofit or otherwise um, sector. So I think what Molly said is actually very true. It, and it is about being proactive in the office environment. And clearly not every office is going to want to listen to you, but because you're, you're either too young, too inexperienced, whatever, the too old, my case. Um, but again, it is being well-read and knowledgeable of what is out there. I mean, with the advent of Google and, and the internet, it's phenomenal, the wealth of information that you can bring to the organization. And um, so I think that's one piece, is being very you know, well-read about what, what, uh, what's available that you can bring, you know, added value to your, the nonprofit or the organization you're with. The other is, in terms of just interaction in the office, it's being, being flexible enough to know when to lead and when to follow. Not always being pushy, not always being silent in meetings. It's, you know, I, I remember one of my very, very first board meetings, I was terrified, and, but I had so much to say. And the CEO later said, why didn't you say anything? And I said, well, there are all these, you know, important people. There were board of directors. And he said, you know, one day you're going to be one of those board members, but you won't do it by being quiet. So, it, again, knowing when to speak up, knowing when to say and bring forth ideas that you have, because you have them. I mean, it's pretty much, um, one of us mentioned earlier, it's the same as being in a family. You know, it's not much different, um, whether in the for-profit sector or not-for-profit sector. I, my experiences, I've used methodologies in both, and they've gotten me where I still am today. I'm still in the sector, and I still love it. So it is just about really using anything and everything out there. So, And, oh, there was one other piece about the whole idea of networking. I mean, tonight you've just got to meet six of us, um, and... You never know where your your job is going to come from. You just never know. It, it, it's really phenomenal to me. Um, I usually get weekly um, job asks um, that I usually recommend to people. So I have this huge bin of resumes of, of people I've met. And sometimes they turn out, you know, to be that person's next phenomenal job. So. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, a, that's an outstanding point. You know, and, and a lot of what you said is really great. I, I think you, you've got to be in the moment when you're working. I think for me, what's been successful is not thinking about what's next. Being present, 
on the tasks in front of you, whether they're mundane or whether they're grand, you know, being there and always doing your best. And even when the blowhard, you know, at the end of the table is talking and you could care less what they're saying, being present and being there and focused. And you never know when your job's gonna, where your job's gonna come from. I got the NRDC job. I'd worked around and near NRDC people for 15, 16 years. And I brought a case in 1998 with some folks from NRDC. We sued the federal government. We sued the Environmental Protection Agency to set pollution limits for all the water bodies in Los Angeles, all the impaired water bodies in Los Angeles in 1998. That same person that I brought that case with gave me a job in NRDC in 2011. You know, and we were, sitting, we were having lunch and he was having a bad day and I was like, what's going on? He's like, oh, I gotta replace this person in Washington DC who just got picked up by the Obama administration. I'm having a hard time and I was like, Hello. <laughs> and he was like, you'd move to DC? And I was like, absolutely. For NRDC, I would. Um, but that was, you know, that was 15 years later. Yep. But he remembered that we worked together, you know, and he actually helped me get the baykeeper job too. Um, so, you know, those connections, they do pay off. And, and when, you, when you demonstrate your abilities and you do it with integrity, people will remember that. Right. When you, when you do it without integrity and screw up and, or are lazy or just indifferent, People remember that too. And they'll be like, ah, they were kind of aloof, kind of flaky. I mean, th you're not gonna stand out, that's for sure. You might stand out in a bad way, but you need to demonstrate to people that you're serious about this stuff. You need to have a demonstrated commitment to these issues if you wanna get in the door with a paid position. And I mean, that's what, at the end of the day, you all wanna, I mean, you need to get paid, you need to live, unless you're all trust fund babies, which I doubt you would've yeah, gone, you would've gone to right. USC, okay. <laughs> Um, but I mean, when I got out of law school, I couldn't get a nonprofit job in the environmental sector for the life of me. I couldn't even, you know, they wouldn't even take volunteers, you know? It's like, well, we got too many volunteers, and it's just like, I can't even volunteer for you? <laughs> what the heck is that all about? And it was true, you know? But then, finally, I met the right people who, they gave me a desk, and they gave me a computer, and they said, go do what you need to do. You know, and then I found some cases and I started doing some stuff and you got to create it for yourself. And then all of a sudden you start making the connection. One guy I interviewed with, I didn't get a job. And then like, and you know, they asked me all these crazy questions in the interview, like so precise about the Clean Water Act. And I was like, I'd never done the Clean Water Act at that point. And I was just like, I do not know the answer. How many, how many hogs does it take to make a concentrated animal feeding operation? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, I live in Los Angeles. <laughs> Two years later, the guy came to an event where I was the keynote speaker, and I was like, oh, it's great to see you. Um, his, actually, his supervisor came, and, he, and I said, what are you doing here? And he's like, he's like, I came to offer you a job. And I'm like, you do realize that you guys turned me down two years ago because I couldn't answer a question about how many hogs are in a factory farm or whatever, and he was like stunned. But you never know how it all might cycle back. Anyway, sorry right. to go um, on and on. And I think the one thing um, is to, yes, you want to network with people that are above you um, and, you know, the VPs and the directors and things like that. But I think you also want to network with the people that are next to you because in three years, you never know where that person's going to be. Um, I've, you know, it's, you want to network with people that are, you're at UCLA for God's sakes. <laughs> You know, everybody's amazing. Um, and you never know where that person next to you is going to, who they know or who they're going to know. It's L.A., you know, the, it, it, you know, it's just one of those things. I've gotten a lot of great opportunities from people that are next to me, not necessarily people that are ahead of me. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we look at, um, at networking as something that's, you know, really uh, impersonal and... Uh, fake. But I, I think if you genuinely are interested in the person that is in front of you and, and make that connection with the, that person, you're going to connect with them and that is the connection that's going to last. You're never going to remember the person that's fake to you. I don't. Um, or as Steve said, you don't remember them for a good reason, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think uh, one thing about internships, it's important to to do internships and, and figure out what you want to do, but also what you don't want to do. And it's the best way to do it is through an internship because you can just leave it and not worry about like what bridge you're burning, you know? So um, just two small things. Uh, can I ask a, a few quick questions? Like how many folks here work for a nonprofit already? Oh, yeah, like, 
there, folks. Uh, how many people, regardless of where you work for, for not profit, how many people like love where they're at? Like they have found their thing and they love it. Okay. How many people are trying to figure out? So what's next? <laughs> okay. Cool. Just sort of interested. Um, I think in terms of directly responding to that question, I, I really want to sort of riffing off what, where Steve started going. Uh, I make a strong pitch for the best way to like move up is not worry about moving up. Like just don't, <laughs> just do your job and do a good job, and things take care of themselves. I just like, and if that sounds too like hunky dory or sort of like like too simple, um, there's a really uh, interesting uh, and I think pretty comprehensive study that came out about West Point cadets like a month or two ago. I think it was published, like empirically showing that. Like they looked at like a whole few thousand folks of like a pretty big data set, I think, and like measured in all sorts of interesting ways that like I don't understand. But uh, it was in the New York Times, so like it was real. <laughs> um, and and consistently with a pretty significant uh, effect, the people who were most successful in getting promoted are the people who are most internally motivated, the people who are least worried about titles and pay and promotion. And I just. I, I think as we research this more, we're going to start to understand it better from a research perspective. But it's like, just find somewhere, and lots of people are trying to do this right now. Just find somewhere you love, find somewhere you love working with the people, find somewhere you love the work, and you'll thrive. You just will because you'll love what you do, and you'll be present, and you'll work hard, and you'll succeed. And when you're like trying to like play the game and figure out what person do I have to, you know, it's like, life is not house of cards. Like just, just. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, DC is a little like house of cards, but like don't just don't go there. Um, <laughs> my take. Um, anyways, it's just, just do you, you know? Well said. <laughs> so if you, if someone finds what they love, they're doing it, they love it, they're having a great time, but they're there for a while, how does one avoid the nonprofit burnout of being, maybe it's just too, it's gone to a point where they're burnt out, they're tired. How do you, how does one avoid that? so they don't have to worry about the what's next. You, you know, as from the mental health standpoint <laughs> and from the wellness perspective, you know, just listen to your friends, listen to your supervisor, your boss, you're coming in with the most noble intent and you might start to experiencing some, what we call compassion fatigue because it does happen. You're gonna be working with a really tough group Sometimes, whether you're at an administrative level or at a line staff level. So listen to that's what I've done. Um, so that when you have a dashboard in front of you and you have a barometer and you know when you're kind of getting a point where you're getting a little tired, a little fatigued, um, it's time to listen to those folks, whether they're asking you or encouraging you to take a day off, uh, take a vacation. Uh, that's good that that's never happened to me, but the fact is that that's something that you, that you need to just be mindful and aware of, and I think that's really critical, because at the end of the day, you are working for people, with people, and um, they're gonna look at, they're gonna see you. You're gonna be self-disclosing who you are by with how you appear, if you're coming to work kind of disheveled and look tired, and you know, so just take care of yourself in that kind of level. Uh, it's really critical, so I think that I would encourage you with that, and obviously you're gonna listen to yourself, but other folks who really care about you, are gonna um, uh, make sure that you're okay and you're in it for the long haul, as a lifer, as we, as we say. I'm a total lifer. Um, and I've followed three basic things. Um, when I get in, have in the past gotten into a place where I just don't think I can do it one more day. And, um, but then I look, I do this little reassessment, I take a look, is it time to leave the party? You know, is it time for me really to see what is, as you're saying, what's the next, if you're already in a nonprofit, um, there are others, there are others out there, and, and sometimes it's time to switch, and I've done it multiple times, and for less pay, more hours, whatever it is, but it's, it, that's one piece, it's just reassessing, is this, you know, if it's, you're bordering burnout, and you have to ask yourself that. The other piece is I always say, okay, uh, it's time to reinvent, which is the next piece. Like, what am I going to become then uh, if I'm not doing what I'm doing right now? And that is, you know, taking the time off the vacay time that you don't have, that they don't give you. To really devote time to yourself, you just have to find it, whatever it is. I'm a night owl. I do that, I do that time thinking, in, you know, when everyone else is asleep. And then the other thing that I look at is recharging, is really looking and balancing the work life 
equation. You can't just go, go, go. Although there's somebody here, I don't know if Julie's still here, um, the Energizer Bunny, I don't know how Julie does what she does. Um, but again, that seems to be something that has worked for me um, is just looking at the work-life balance and you know whether it's yoga, running, whatever it is, you just have to do something else to balance it. Otherwise, you will get to that burnout. And I don't know, actually, I did hit a burnout point and then I went into the for-profit sector. I did that for a while. It was good. It was fun for all that I came back. Um, and now I'm in somewhat of a hybrid situation where I work with nonprofits as a consultant um, because I've been able to do um, enough kind of going back and forth from the various sectors to um, be able to help a lot of organizations um, get to where they need to get. So, yeah. You know, as someone who's a supervisor and someone that um, has employees um, or people that work with me, um, I would hope that my, my person would come to me um, and that's the kind of environment that I foster and those are who I oversee, come to me, let's talk about it. Let's find other projects that might have, have interest of, that might be interesting to you. I actually just transitioned one of my employees over to another position and then brought somebody else in. It is my job, and that's I see as my job, is to find the best position for the people that work for me. Whether it's with me or transitioning them out to something else, what I look for in my supervisor is someone that's going to be my partner in my career and it's someone that's going to look at the best moves, next moves for me and have my best interests at heart. And so when you're applying for a position anywhere, you're going to mirror the person that you work for. Your work schedule is going to mirror their work schedule. If they're a workaholic, you bet you're going to be a workaholic. If there's someone that, that respects the work-life balance, and that's someone that's something that's very new to me now. I just have a new um, manager that came up with us two years ago, and she is wonderful. She's someone that really does, for, like she goes to Dodger games, and she goes, and she's one of those people that really truly respects the work-life balance. And that's how our office has changed, and, that's, and that is a new revitalization for our office too. Um, and I think that that's a, I, in an interview, you're, they're interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. You're finding if that's the right environment for you. Um, I mean, of course, you all want a, a job and it's something, you know, you're, but I think if you're going into a job that you already know you're not gonna like your supervisor, that's not gonna be successful for anybody. So just keep that in mind. Great. Well, I wanted to, first and foremost, I wanna thank our panelists before, um, but before we do that and end the session, I wanna ask the group, do you all have any questions for our panelists? Great, we're gonna bring a wireless mic over to you. Just wait one second, right here in the front. Right here, right here in the front. Hello, thank you first of all for all of your insights. Um, this is also to anyone, but it's I guess maybe more directed to Molly first. What would you say is the most important for I guess getting your foot in the door if you have a really different academic experience. Like you mentioned, you're a physiological science, so we're a combination of bio and physiological science, so how would we, in our first position, like right out of college, like well, I guess what would be the most important transferable skill to like highlight in an interview or resume for something that might be completely different than like what we did in school? Um, great question. Um, it's definitely not impossible. I think we all think, you know, when we go to apply for a job, we have to have this very linear story that just makes sense. Um, if you look at my background, I was a phi sci major and then I was working for the city of Malibu. That was kind of my burnout story when I was, I think, a junior here. I thought, I can't do this anymore. I want to quit. Like, me quit school? What is even happening? Um, and I went and I got a part-time job with the city of Malibu working for their parks and rec department. Did that for then five years. Um, so did that and then went back to business school and then um, was working for a consulting firm with nonprofits and then now I'm with Chrysalis. So yeah, I can tell a story in an interview and I can make it all make sense. But um, in reality, I think we all bring so much to the table. Um, a lot of it is just, you know, we talk about all wanting to be with people that we want to work with. You have to be that person that somebody wants to work with in that interview. Um, 
I just interviewed for a position um, where we went through, I must have interviewed um, 20, 20 people at least um, for this position, and it was a nightmare interviewing 20 people, as you can imagine. Um, but there were only a, you know, a few folks that were able to sit across the table from me and my colleague who um, I was interviewing them with, and I could think, okay, I can work with them. Um, and it wasn't because they had years of experience in the trash industry. You know, I don't need years of experience in the trash industry. I need someone who's enthusiastic enthusiastic, someone who is willing to learn, um, someone that takes initiative, and someone that's just active and present, you know, it's it's something that you can just feel. Um, so I think, I mean, just take little tidbits of it, everything that everyone said tonight, where it's, you know, that be real and that be present, um, and don't worry about it, seriously. Um, and I know that's really easy for me to say, and I'm going to think about that same exact thing when I go to get my next job, you know? <laughs> like, how am I, I run a trash business, you know? But, um, you know, and I'd be happy to talk offline with you more if you'd want about, you know, maybe it's academic activities that you have here. Um, I was, um, co I think, what was it, co-chair of UNICEF at UCLA when I was here. So that was something that I definitely spoke to, right? Yeah, you think I want to go to med school, but I was really doing this UNICEF thing, and that was, you know, like, shiny object over here. Um, um, so, you know, I'd be happy to talk with you offline if you wanted to more about it. I think what Molly said is very true. Um, you, it doesn't, the, your major really isn't what really is going to get your job, unless it's law, a lawyer, or something specific like that. Um, I was an English major. How did I become, you know, a foundation administrator? What does that have to do with English literature? I read more novels than anybody, and um, it had nothing to do with anything. But what really, in terms of interviews um, that I've done or that I've you know, been interviewing for a job, I have learned that in the first three to five minutes, there is a fit. There is this, it's chemistry. I mean, you might say, oh, that's kind of you know, touchy-feely stuff. But when you're interviewing or someone's interviewing you, that person is looking for somebody to fit their team. And your major is not going to, to necessarily influence it. That's not, I mean, it's gonna be important that you have certain skills, that you can write, you can read, you know. Um, you, you all have degrees from UCLA. That usually is one of the deciding factors for me. I go, are they a Bruin? <laughs> like, because if I had 10 candidates or 20, and they're, let's say they're all great and I like them all, I go back to, the, oh, but maybe they're, you know, you know, you have, you have this amazing degree from this university. So again, I seriously, in the, five, the first five minutes, I can kind of tell if I'm gonna be able to get along with this person because I've got a lot of work to do and I don't really care if your degree was zoology or if you were a former lawyer. If there is something going on there, because I'm looking to put together a fabulous team to get the job done. So don't get discouraged. <laughs> Yeah, just to put like a tiny bit of a finer point on that, I've probably done like, I don't know, like 200, 300 interviews in the last five years, and, and zero of them have I cared what someone's major is. So, you know, that's not true yeah. for every job, but just like to give you a little bit of it, like my perspective into that. I also like, it's been said a few times, but I really want to underline it. Just like go get involved in whatever you want to do in whatever way you can. Just go, we have like multiple members of our leadership team, like the highest levels of our organization who started as interns or volunteers or whatever. It's just like, just, uh, I thought Steve's story was fantastic. Just go, whatever you want to do, just go find a way to start doing it somehow, some way, and the ball's balanced and eventually just find your way in the door getting paid. Can I add one yes, more thing? Sorry, sure. use your network. Um, if you're a Bruin, go find a Bruin that you can talk to, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's a quick phone call. You know, try just for a phone call. Setting up a coffee. I know it sounds easy, but it can be hard, right? And then you get into logistics where we're going to meet. Try to get a 10-minute, 15-minute phone call with a Bruin. Uh, my question is to Sally Lou. Um, if you would start a nonprofit organization, but this organization uh, hasn't been anything like that created yet, it's something new, what would you suggest to do? Okay, so the, it, the organization already exists? The, um, oh no, doesn't no. it? You have an idea. Yes. You have an idea and you want it to be, okay. There are many things that one can do. Um, when you have a fabulous idea and you want to implement it or execute it and apply for an, um, a nonprofit status to become a 501c3, 
Um, there is a lot of free information online in terms of how you go through the process of becoming a nonprofit. Is that no, I mean, um, you know, a lot of nonprofit organizations, they have similar maybe backgrounds or uh, similar services, but the one I want, I have an idea, there's not anything similar to that. It's something very new. Mm -hmm. So who I would go to, to talk to who can help, help you with get that. there? Yeah. Um, there is an organization called Community Partners, and they are an idea incubator, basically. They will take on groups that have interesting ideas and they will help build so it becomes an organization it can become um, a nonprofit ultimately if not there's another idea and that is look for the organizations that you can align with and maybe propose or introduce your idea as an initiative that they might take on or talk to a funder who might know where you know where there might be other organizations that you could plug into. Does that make sense? Yes, makes sense. Or I can Thank talk you to you so more much. later, too. Yes. Yeah. I might add also talk with organizations that are doing similar things because it's not to say that they haven't tried something that's you know more closely um, like your idea, but that maybe there's a reason that they tweaked or went a different way. So learn from organizations recreating themselves because trust me, we all do it. We try mm -hmm. this, that doesn't work, you go this way. Um, Hello, and thank you for speaking to us. Um, I had a question and was interested in your comments about uh, people interested in corporate social responsibility and nonprofit partnerships. Um, is that something that you guys participate in? And if so, you know, how does that go for you? And do you have any advice for people interested in the CSR kind of side of it? Um, I mean, I think it's, at least at Planned Parenthood, we partner with um, companies that have corporate corporate responsibilities within their organization, whether it be Paramount Pictures, Skechers Foundation, whatever. They are grant-making organizations and we work with them, whether it be event sponsorships or whatever. But there are organizations, a, most, a good amount of companies here in LA have corporate responsibility positions within their company. Like Paramount, Picture, Paramount Pictures has a whole department of corporate responsibility. Um, they have like five people that that's, the job of those five people to kind of find volunteer opportunities for Paramount Picture employees, grant out money from Paramount Pictures, do event sponsorships. So there are many opportunities. I actually um, connect with me. I actually have someone that works at Skechers Foundation right now. That's her job. She kind of deals with Skechers and how they, as an organization, as a shoe company, look from a corporate responsibilities perspective. You know, they do walks, they do you know, as a group. You know, I think a lot of, you know, Wells Fargo does it, Bank of America does it. They, they for their employees as a part of um, kind of retention almost, because, you know, people want to do good. And the, the best way to do that is to have it within your organization. Um, like Roll International, they um, give every one of their employees $1,000 a year to give to whatever organization they want to. And someone has to manage that. So there's you know, opportunities within corporations to do that too. Great. Any more questions? Hi, uh, my name is Gina and I'm a UCLA grad 04. Um, and I'm a founder of a nonprofit called Pinups for Vets and we produce World War II pinup calendars that raise money for veterans healthcare. Um, and I wanted to ask you guys um, specifically about fundraising um, and my and Sally, maybe a little bit more for you because our nonprofit is seen as a little bit more controversial because it has pinups. Um, we struggle with grants. Um, and you know, writing to Coca-Cola and Xerox. And I wanted to ask all of you about sort of innovative fundraising ideas. Um, and if you do have a bit more of a controversial organization, how do you target funding? Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, for us, I mean, I think for you, I, I'm not gonna talk about it from Flame Marinette's perspective, but, for, but as a fundraiser, um, I would look for companies that would benefit from your um, kind of market. Who who is who's your who's your customer? Who's some, who is someone that you're reaching, and how does that benefit the company that you're looking at? Sell it to them. I you know our my event has a thousand people that are um, you know young and hip. 
go to Uber. That's a, you know, Uber is a perfect kind of, um, you know, they're looking to gain a market in your world, right? It's a, bu it's a business for these companies. They want to look good. They're not going to give money away quietly. They're not, <laughs> right? Why would they do that? So, I mean, I think that's, you know, I think that's what, you know, we, as, you know, as an organization, we don't have a lot of corporate. Um, we, we are strongly funded by individuals. Um, and that's, and that's um, you, know, it's, it's some, it, you know, it's hard. People are like, I'm gonna give you, you know, we have leaders in business all the way up that give us their personal money, but would never touch us with their corporate money. Because they don't want, you know, because a Planned Parenthood has a stigma and that it, it has, you know, a, everybody, you know, has a, a feeling about it one way or the other. So um, I think that, you know, it's finding your niche and going after it and going after it hard. Like, I think it's selling it to them. There um, is a library at the Center for Nonprofit Management downtown over on the, at the endowment, the California Endowment Campus. And they have an extensive library and volumes of books. And you just research, you just pop in a name, you know, a word, and it will generate um, possible matches in terms of foundations or funders or corporations, that, probably less corporations, but um, that might be a good fit for the kind of, you know, support you're looking for. Um, and that, you know, with any, any um, organization. Um, and then there was something, Ma, you mentioned, um, I, I just lost the thought, but, you know, that's one resource to go to. And they also offer um, classes, they're, you know, nominal fee, or I don't know if you know of it or have been there, um, as does community partners. They also offer um, classes for grant seekers to meet, the thing is, meeting the people that give the money away. And that's, it, sometimes it's one-on-one, -on -one. Um, somebody you meet at a panel like this might know of a foundation or um, an individual that would be supportive of your cause, so. Okay. Maybe we'll do one last question over there. Hello, um, so I've recently been hearing a lot about um, how nonprofits can be a little bit inefficient when compared to like, let's say for-profit social enterprises. So I was wondering if you guys have had any experiences to, you know, maybe like advantages or disadvantages to um, like the administrative side of working for a nonprofit versus not working for a nonprofit and your opinions on for-profit social enterprises versus the traditional nonprofit. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just going to answer as honestly as I can. I, I think the labels don't mean that much, in, in my opinion. I mean, you could have, uh, you, have, you have nonprofits that are the most efficient organizations in the world, and nonprofits that are the least efficient organizations in the world. I assume the same is true of, um, of the other side of the ledger. And I, look, I mean, there's all sorts of things out there, right, that, that are because there's nonprofit or corporate, corporate social responsibility or anything, social enterprise, anything in this sector, right? Like, because it sounds nice, there's a lot of stuff that just sort of sits around out there sounding nice and like spending money but not actually making an impact, right? Like that happens, that's a real thing. I think it happens everywhere where things sound nice. Um, and so I think that's the question to ask about anywhere you're going, whether it's like CSR or nonprofit or social enterprise, any of that stuff is just like, are, are, are folks actually getting the job done here or not? And I think it's a, a relevant question no matter what the label is. Um, every nonprofit has to fill out a 990 and report how it raises money. So those, and you can check on GuideStar, Charity Navigator, any of those organizations. And as someone who, you know, receives donor money, it's my responsibility to use our donor money as efficient as possible. And that is my job as, as a donor, as a, a manager of donor money to really make sure that we're reporting back to our donors on exactly how much we spend and, and what we use towards administrative costs. And every nonprofit has to. Every nonprofit has an annual report. Every nonprofit has a 990 they have to report. So if you're giving away money or you're giving to an organization or you want to go work for an organization, check it out. You, I mean, it might, as, it might sound good, but be totally inefficient. You know, you never know. There's 75,000 organizations. Right. They are bound to be inefficient. <laughs> good. 
Well, join me in giving our panelists a round of applause. Thank you so much. Again, we, our panelists will be here, so if you did have specific questions, please do come up and talk with them, find them, um, because they are such wealth of knowledge. And so thank you for all of you shared today. Um, just before we go, though, um, I wanted to give you a couple more announcements of different events that are coming up. Um, we actually may have gotten emails about nachos and networking. We have about six to seven more that are happening. Um, so please do, if you are interested, sign up. There may or may not be nachos, but there definitely will be networking. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, some, uh, but there'll be great food. Um, but those are actually great uh, opportunities to really use what these um, our panelists have talked about of really being genuine, of being present, and of being real in who you are and meeting people. Because really, Bruins meeting Bruins, it's nothing better than that. So definitely want to go. be sure to attend an event if you can. Also, if you feel like you want to give back and want to give back to a UCLA student, uh, you can apply to be, or not, apply. You actually can just sign up to be an alumni mentor. We have students who want to talk to people and connect with alumni, and so if you feel that you are in that space that you would love, like to do that, definitely sign up. Also, if you're interested in entertainment field, we do have a UC alumni and entertainment event. This is for all alumni and all the UCs are gathering at Quixote Studios on September 3rd. And so if you're interested in that, uh, look out for that. And also save the date, our next Bruin Foodies event is uh, featuring uh, the owner, Alex Liu, of uh, Blockheads. So um, if you are interested in Blockheads, you know it's owned by a Bruin, you know they do good too. So uh, be sure to look out for that. Also, if you go to football games and you're interested in UCL, LA athletics and sports, we have what we call Bruin Bash. It's actually going to be alumni tent at the Rose Bowl, so look out for those uh, opportunities as well. And then also a plug for our OC young alumni, they're having a cosmic bowling night. So if you just want something fun um, and bowl at night, uh, be sure to go. And so also look for different uh, professional uh, fun opportunities on our Facebook page, uh, UCLA Young Alumni. Be sure to uh, like it. We will have updates. We will post this video when it's ready um, and just information about our other events as well. And highlight alumni, Gabe Rose was on it, so we, he featured him. So uh, be sure to uh, like that page. And again, if you have any questions, my colleagues, um, Angela and Sandy in the back and myself, if you like today's event or you have ideas as well, something you'd love to see UCLA do, let us know. We would love to have your feedback. We definitely uh, want to serve you. And so talk to us. Let us know if you have anything that you think would be great. So again, thank you so much. And give a round of applause to our panelists tonight. Thank you. So feel free to have some more food, network with one another, come meet our panelists, and enjoy. <laughs>